right. good morning, good afternoon, or even good evening, depending on where in the world you are. My name is Michael Carducci, and I want to welcome you to the latest in the No Fluff Just a Virtual Webinar Series. And this week, I am joined in the studio with Daniel Hinojosa. Dano, welcome. And we are oh, talking wow. about a very exciting topic, uh, specifically Project Loom. Project Loom allows us to do some insanely cool things with concurrency in a very lightweight fashion. Uh, and I assume that this starts to drive into some of these other concepts like continuations and fiber, fibers. Is that correct? Correct. This Hi. is super cool stuff. And, uh, and it could not come at a better time for me because we're getting into building some of this complex high concurrency stuff. And I absolutely want some modern tools in my tool belt. If nothing else, cool. I hate shooting myself with a multi-threaded gun. Uh, shooting mm -hmm. myself in the foot, that is, with a multi-threaded gun. So I'm going to hand everything over to Dano. He's got a great deal of expertise on this topic, and uh, I am very excited. Of course, as we go, feel free to ask questions, utilize the chat. And of course, Daniel, you can see the chat while you're presenting. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I may miss it just because I'll be uh, focused on some slides. But let me ask you a, a question then. And uh, we have uh, Dave, uh, Dave Klein. Uh, what's, your, uh, what's your official title? Now you're uh, developer like, advocate, developer advocate for uh, Confluent. Uh, so uh, sending this uh, over to you, Michael. Uh, did you guys end up uh, using a lot of uh, Kafka? Uh, uh, yeah, we're still in process. Oh, okay. oh, we're still in process. We're still defining it, but uh, but right now we 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 do have a Kafka cluster in production, and we're building out Ooh, uh, a very yeah. cool event driven workflow right now, and nice. and we're defining where Kafka fits in elsewhere in our microservice architecture as well. Good. Well, uh, it was just it was just the reason I'm asking is just that it's related, uh, just because you know producers. Uh, will can be on a thread. A producer is also um, capable of being multi-threaded, but a consumer does not. So, uh, even with the simplest things of like producing and consuming, you know, certainly threading can sometimes you know sneak up behind you and and do terrible things for you, especially in the in the Kafka world. So. Uh, excellent. Interesting. All right. So I'll be yeah. paying, paying particular attention to that as well. And of course, <laughs> uh, one thing I want to mention as we as as we as we kind of dive into this that all of these topics there are opportunities to dive deeper into. Of course, uh, we do virtually daily live instructor led training courses with No Fluff Just Stuff, and in fact. Uh, uh, you know, jump over to nofluffjuststuff.com to check that out. There are some insane deals right now, some bundles that they are offering to get access to this daily training, the replays, uh, all of the, 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 the recorded content from con conferences like RConf and UberConf, uh, as well as our upcoming live conferences where we can interact in person again and not just through a screen. Yeah. Although I do like the suggestion in chat that we had <laughs> to, uh, to have a 100% virtual conference where everybody has the cat filter on. Uh, cat conf cat conf 2021 i think we need to make that happen but enough from me enough about no fluff let's dive into all of this stuff over to you Dan. i'm just gonna start doing like presentations in the cat filter i'm really not a cat i'm here, all right, I'm here so live i'm here live early all right so welcome everybody uh so uh slides and uh, let's see let me uh, move my uh, camera stuff out of the way here. Uh, slides and code are available here at uh, github.com forward slash D Inohosa, my name, uh, Project Loom uh, study. I'll uh, continually add to this until it is official. And then uh, I don't know what I'll do with this repository, but it's here. Uh, and also uh, take a look for any updates that I may have if you're interested in my uh, repository, of course. Uh, so Project Loom, how could I like simplify this? Well, this was on the website. Uh, so <laughs> I'll just go with what they say. Uh, easy to use, high throughput, lightweight concurrency and new programming models on the Java platform. So key elements for this is that we're going to be using something called a virtual thread, which we treat like a thread, just like the Java Lang thread that we've used uh, for uh, since JDK 1. Uh, back in the late 90s, uh, back when we listened to grunge music, <laughs> uh, encode at, at runtime in the debugger and a profiler. In fact, uh, we're going to, just because the way it's designed, we're able to uh, do better debugging and, and do better profiling. Uh, virtual thread is not a wrapper around an OS thread, but a Java entity or a Java object 
that we can also introspect after it runs, which is really exciting as well. So we'll talk about that. Uh, creating a virtual thread is cheap. We could have millions of them. And we don't have to think about pulling. Right now, uh, we do a lot of pulling of threads, and we kind of have to think about you know, how many threads do I have? What happens if I block all of them? I mean, there's a lot of stuff that we got to think about. Uh, blocking a virtual thread is cheap, so we could be synchronous. In fact, it tells you uh, to do so. Uh, no language changes are necessarily needed, although it's not quite out yet, so I'm not sure that this will be an official statement quite yet, but that's what they're going for. Pluggable schedulers to offer flexibility of asynchronous programming. Uh, now, I started Java uh, in, I think it was that same year, and uh, I ran the program the first time, and I got a null pointer exception, and I said, this is stupid, I'll never use this. <laughs> and then it just ended up my favorite language, but that's the way my life goes. Uh, but um, when we started with uh, JDK 1, or I think I started probably around JDK 1.1, uh, we had something called green threads. I don't know if you remember those. Uh, but that was kind of like a many to one sort of thing where we had one OS thread, which is we only had one processor. Multi cores weren't necessarily a thing yet. And so, you know, given these green threads, they would all just take turns on that particular OS thread. And then 1.2 came out, and that was really, really awesome. Also known as uh, JDK2 version 1.2. Remember, sales had their own <laughs> version numbers as opposed to um, as as opposed to the engineers. <laughs> it was confusing for everyone else, but we loved it. Anyway, so <laughs> for something like that, uh, you know, whenever we needed a thread, we just hopped on that thread, and we're still doing that today, even if we're using something like an executor service, uh, where we have a particular task or a uh, a callable or a runnable that we wish to run on a particular thread uh, that gets a dedicated uh, OS thread as it runs. And it's up to uh, the uh, kernel thread or the OS thread to determine when to preempt it, to halt it so that others get a chance. Uh, so that's the way we've been operating in Java for uh, the last few years. Uh, so here comes a change, probably in JDK 17. Uh, we will have a many, many to re, uh, many to many relationship uh, between the threads. It's almost like green threads the way they were before, uh, but these are going to be called virtual threads. They were called fibers before, but they're opting for the word uh, virtual thread, uh, where our threading is actually going to be Java objects. Java is going to handle things like the preemption and other things like that, and will schedule on the OS threads, but it's not gonna be up to the OS threads. Uh, OS threads aren't uh, going to manage things quite as well because they don't know the internals of the language quite as well. So what they're deciding to do is, you know, do all of the work uh, that is needed for the scheduling and everything like that uh, inside of Java. So that's really uh, super exciting. So concepts, let's uh, discuss some concepts here before we continue, and then uh, we'll go ahead and address some questions. Uh, concurrency. So things that are uh, concurrent would be something like this, where things would be uh, time shared. Uh, one great way to discuss something like this is talking and drinking at the same time, right? Uh, my mouth needs to be concurrent. And if I try to drink something uh, in the intermediary, like I could just be talking right now and then take a drink. I can't, you know, talk afterwards unless I'm extremely talented and one of those ventriloquists that are able to do it. Uh, but for that, I cannot. Uh, so that's, uh, that's kind of a, a, what a concurrency is. A parallelism would be like on a separate thread or as a human being, uh, being able to walk or talk or be able to clap my hands and talk at the same time, right? I have two different processes that are doing something together. Now, I could have both like a concurrency and parallelism uh, together. So I could have something like this and uh, per CPU would be concurrent. But since I have multiple CPUs, I could be parallel uh, in my operations, okay? So uh, differences in there. So uh, some other glossary terms that we have. Uh, on the uh, kernel or on the uh, operating system, if there are more runnable threads than CPUs, eventually the OS will preempt. So you, if you've never seen that term before when it comes to you know, multi-core processors and processes and concurrency, that means that 
uh, the OS uh, thread currently would say, stop what you're doing. Uh, I, need a, I need to give some time over, it's kind of like timeshares, right? Uh, <laughs> when you get a timeshare in the Caribbean, same sort of thing, right? There isn't like multiple people there at the same time. But I need to share this time uh, with some other process, okay? So this causes what's called a context switch, uh, which requires saving the execution context of whatever it is that we had of the currently running thread and restoring the execution context of the newly scheduled thread. And this causes a lot of problems uh, when going from one to the other, particularly with some like thread locals. Uh, schedulers, so in our dream world, it'd be great if we had one-to-one -one thread to CPU correspondence, that'd be great. I have my own very CPU uh, and I could use it whenever I want to. Uh, but either the JVM or the underlying platform's operating system will decipher and share the process or resource amongst threads. This is called thread scheduling. JVM or OS that performs the scheduling of the threads is called a thread scheduler. So when we discuss the term thread scheduling, that's all it means. I'm scheduling a particular thread ready for it to be used on my operating system. Another term that you may hear about is uh, the user space or the kernel space. Uh, user level is the Java Lang thread runs within the JVM. We're talking about the JVM space. Our language space is what we're referring to. Uh, specific handling, again, which is up to the language. In our case, Java or the JVM. Kernel threads are more general. Uh, they create uh, memory in a general fashion. They don't know essentially how the language does things and how the language optimizes it. So it just tries to make a good guess for it. Uh, and so each user level thread created by the application is eventually going to be known to the kernel. All right, here's another term, blocking operations, which I think all of you know already, but some of you may not. So let's discuss that. You can't avoid blocking operations, although we certainly try. <laughs> uh, and we're getting better at it. Like uh, for example, there's non-blocking IO and that's been around since uh, NIO came out, which is, I don't know how long ago that was, but uh, we have some you know, new IO calls that are non-blocking, which is excellent. Uh, but uh, we have things that are unavoidably blocking. That would be like thread sleep, thread join, socket connect, socket read, socket write, object wait, and a few more. And if you take a look at this particular link, they list them uh, all out. And that's the hard part. Things, things will block and uh, do something or whatever it is that we need. We call a future get, for example, that's also a block as well. So there are a lot of different calls that block. And that's where things get uh, a little bit prickly just because we're blocking. How do we handle what happens when we block? What happens if we block too long? Uh, you know, are we going to take up the thread? Are we going to keep other processes from uh, being able to run? And that's going to be uh, a particular issue here. All right, well, let's take a look here at some uh, questiones. Uh, bring on the cat filters. Uh, yeah, so the, uh, I'll talk about thread locals. Uh, they're going to try to do a uh, kind of a different one for thread locals. Uh, they're just going to try to do like a, a kind of a local variable uh, that uh, you can use with its concurrent programming style. So we'll talk about that. All right, so let's continue then. So what are some of the problems that we face today? Um, I didn't even realize it until I started researching this topic that I even had any problems. Uh, but I guess it's one of those things that I just got so used to, the problems that it just seemed like something I needed to do as a job. <laughs> so uh, threads by themselves uh, are expensive to create. We can't have millions of threads right now. Uh, threads are mostly idle. We're not maximizing its use. Uh, threads are also not scalable. And so how do we compensate for this? Uh, we could compensate with the Java util future callbacks, uh, which I think is uh, what we uh, use quite a bit. So uh, typically you'll have some sort of Lambda that would kind of react or respond whenever something happens. Uh, async blocks, await blocks in other languages. Uh, sometimes we could use promises or what are called incomplete futures. So there's a completable future. I don't know if you know this, but you can create it, what's called an incomplete future, which is you instantiate a completable future and at some certain point you answer it manually uh, yourself. You complete it manually. Uh, 
Reactive programming, and I love this. I love reactive programming. I love RxJava. I've been using it for quite a few years. I love my RxJava, my ACA streams. I know some of you enjoy Spring, like Project Reactor is probably one of those uh, that you enjoy. Kotlin has coroutines, which is something that we're going to be using uh, when it comes to Loom. So we'll, more about that, but uh, we're taking a page from Kotlin. It's great that the JVM has uh, other languages to learn from and see you know, what kind of pitfalls they experience. And so Java is able to take that and do something uh, within the Java language. Suspendable functions, which again is a part of a coroutine. So the ability to run through some code, pause, put it on a shelf, do something else, come back later and resume wherever we need to. All right, let's see. Looks like we got a few questions here or statements. Okay, very good, Jeff Grigg, excellent. All thread local, thread local. Uh, okay, excellent, yep, uh, uh, and uh, very good. All right, so uh, another way that uh, we've gone about this is uh, Vertex. I don't know if any of you have used Vertex. Vertex is a lot of fun. It's all concurrent, it's all future-based, and the way they do it is using something called uh, an event loop, okay? So if I have a request, and so everything has its own part. And so that's what makes this kind of interesting uh, with something like Vertex is that you make a request, it hits the event loop, uh, whatever is happening in the event loop and how you program it, you should never block uh, within this event loop. And this is a sample for my Vertex uh, presentation. But its only goal is to be kind of like the postal uh, worker here, take whatever request you have and distribute it over to a worker thread. And these worker threads can block. And so we kind of have to fracture our brain and think about what pools do we get, uh, what are going to be blockable, what are not going to be blockable, uh, and make sure that we're using the correct pool. Uh, one of the things that we usually have to think about is, are we running something for a CPU calculation? If so, that's pretty quick and terminates very quickly, like two plus two, right? <laughs> I just need to calculate four and then be done. That's my job. IO is a little bit different though because IO we have to you know we don't know how long that's going to take uh, that could fail and so there are a lot of different possibilities for it which is why we tend to have a separate thread pool for IO operations. Now I'm a big fan of RxJava and for RxJava uh, I love it like I love this idea and it was really kind of easy for me to uh, comprehend what was going on uh, the top part, like from this observable just do on next, uh, could be an IO thread. In other words, I am getting something from a web service. So usually the first part of a flow like this would be, hey, get something from this web service. Okay. And then on this observe on the third line that you see here, switch. So I'm going to switch over to a computation thread which means I'm just doing some computation. I'm not doing any IO and that's usually the inner part for this. And then when I'm ready to you know, jump over to some side effect operation like storing to a database or calling another web service perhaps, or uh, since Dave Klein's here, um, you know, producing uh, to Kafka and, or whatever it is. Uh, for that, I'd have to jump over to an I.O. thread, so something that is specialized to handle I.O. and uh, then do whatever operation I need to. And so for something like this, um, you know, it's great because I'm able to declaratively state which kind of scheduler or which kind of thread pool do I wish to operate on. Now, if you're not familiar with this, the subscribe on means go to the very, very beginning and say from that point down, uh, use the IO thread. And it's, it's what causes these uh, first two lines uh, to be on a different thread. And I love this declarative style, really easy. And it's really great for things like uh, GUIs. Now, uh, as uh, stated, if you have data structure that isn't safe for concurrent access, uh, you can sometimes use an instance per thread, hence something called thread local. Thread locals have been used for, you know, setting a variable for thread locality, but it has some shortcomings. They're unstructured, uh, they are mutable. And again, all of us have been moving a lot further into immutable territory. So, you know, what do we do? 
So once a thread local is set, it is in effect throughout the thread's lifetime until it sets some other value. But the thing is that a thread local can be shared amongst other tasks. So if other tasks are needing to use the same thread local for something else, then things can go wrong and we have things like thread locals can leak to one another. And so this is from the uh, Loom uh, uh, website uh, for setting up an old value or getting the old value and some of the things that you would need to do is set a new value for whatever it is you need to do, do the work that you need to do, and then reset the old value. And you could kind of smell the code smell, right, for something like this. And so that could be a problem. Uh, other problem is complicated tracing. So a lot of what's happening here is uh, mutability and sometimes that particular state goes away and that tends to be an issue as well, okay? Um, complex cancellation can sometimes be a problem as well. And again, these are some of the things that we've been dealing with all this time, uh, but um, you know, there are better ways to go about it. So when a thread is interrupted, it has to be clear and reset the status because it has to go back into the pool. Which is kind of sad, right? Just, you know, hey, I want you to stick around. I, I need to know more about the thread. And so that thread's going to say, I'm sorry. I just got to go back to the pool and super sad. And <laughs> that's just the way things are. It'd be nice to take a look at the state after it's done. Uh, losing stack traces as well. So a lot of these are very transient. They, they go fast very quickly. So it'd be nice to have something that you know, would be an object that we could go through the process and at the end be able to introspect how things, uh, you know, what were successful or if they were a failure. And that's where this wonderfulness for uh, virtual threading comes in, which is what Loom provides for us. So virtual threads, uh, we will just, uh, sorry, pardon me here. So virtual threads, we're just going to just treat like threads. They're just called virtual threads. They're very lightweight, um, one kilobyte, fast to create, uh, creating and blocking. So we had just talked about what blocking is, right? Thread moves and then holds there, hold, hold, hold until you know it gets whatever it needs and then we will continue on. Uh, creating and blocking a virtual thread is cheap and encouraged. So 23 million virtual threads is about uh, 16 gigabytes in memory. They're managed by the runtime and unlike the existing platform threads are not one-to-one -one wrappers. Rather, they are implemented in our user space, not the kernel space, which is our JDK. And the OS can support up to a thousand active threads. Uh, Java runtime can support millions of virtual threads, which is really nice. And every unit concurrency in the application domain is represented by a thread making things a little bit easier. And it's easier for our brain as well. All right. All right. Uh, give me a second here. Hey, Michael, are you there? Michael. All right, I'll go ahead and continue. All right. Give me a second, just go. Gonna... All right, there we go. All right, so let's talk about a continuation. All right. So a continuation is gonna be an object representing a computation that could be suspended, resumed, cloned, or serialized. So think about a program, like what I'm uh, showing here, where I could just you know, go line by line. But whenever I hit a block, then I could pause right there and then take the stack and move it off shelf, okay? When it reaches a call that blocks, again, that will yield the JVM to use another virtual thread in that process. So let's take a look at what a continuation is. All right, so coming in over here, let's take a look and uh, let me make sure I'm sharing the right screen. I am not. All right, here we go. All right, so let's take a look at a continuation. So as part of Loom in Java Lang, we're going to get a continuation. Uh, statement here, note that this is lower level. 
And uh, we will not need to do this ourselves. This is something that Loom will do behind the scenes. Uh, but what I have here is I have a method called work uh, where uh, for things like this, I'm going to have certain levels that would turn on. And this is kind of like a callback in Ruby, for example. I think Ruby has a yield uh, as well. And this is where I first learned about it. Uh, but what a continuation will do is it will go through this right here until we get to the yield part and stop and halt. And then what that's going to do is it's going to kind of trap the rest of this and uh, pass it on as a tuple uh, back to the running portion over here. Now, what is that going to do? That means we can stop and halt until we want to go a little bit further. And so if we go a little bit further, then we'll go level two or level three or level four, uh, all a bit at a time. So let me go ahead and run this. So again, what we're going to do is we're gonna go here and yield and stop. Okay, then next round, we're gonna come here and stop. The next round, we're gonna go here and stop, et cetera, et cetera. Now, behind the scenes, what's going to happen is the moment that we do something like a thread sleep, for example, which is a blocking call, that's where we're going to pause, yield back, and then possibly park. We'll talk about parking here in a bit, but put this to a side, and then that way we could pick it up later. And that's what a continuation is, the ability to continue uh, forward, okay? So let me go ahead and run this, and so that way we could kind of see what that looks like. And uh, let's see here, control R, let's do E0 continuations, and let's go ahead and run this. And what we're gonna see over here is we're going to see um, starting, and uh, I believe it's uh, run. Now we'll take a look here what the results are, and away we go. So do you get that? We are just going to go a little bit at a time. And what we're going to do is whenever we see a blocking call, then we're going to halt uh, right there. And we'll say we'll continue uh, a little bit later, and then we will come back. Kind of like when you're at a restaurant, once you're given the food, the, the waiter will come back, right? <laughs> the waiter will let you eat the food uh, for a bit there. So here it is, begin. Well, we'll have running, then we'll have begin, running, level one, running, level two, and let's come back to the code and see what's going on here. So we'll have running, and then this continuation run here. And so what we're going to do is we're gonna go here to begin, and then we'll yield. Once we yield, we come back again. And that's why when you see this over here, this is why you see multiple runnings, because we're, uh, we're going through this a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, until we get our completion. So think in your mind then, you know, what is this yield going to look like whenever we have a blocking call? Same sort of thing as like, you know, a waiter pro or a waitress providing a meal for somebody, I'll come back, right? Uh, it'll be kind of creepy for them just to stare at you and watch you chew. <laughs> Can I help you with something? I've had one waiter do that where they just wanted to talk about things and I'm, I, I don't wanna chat right now. Can I, can I finish my meatballs? It was actually meatballs. Anyway, so <laughs> that's, that's what this uh, continuation is all about, okay? All right, so uh, here, let me just uh, see any questions. Are we doing good? So continuations are now part of Java Lang. All right, well, let's uh, continue on. Oops, sorry about that. Let me keep doing it. All right, here we go. So how scheduling works. So kernel scheduler, again, is very general, makes assumptions about what the user language requires, but virtual threads are tailored and specific for the JVM. And virtual thread scheduling uh, with the kernel space is abstracted away from us. So we don't have to worry about it unless you feel a little bit pedantic about it and want to create your own scheduler. But again, it's just something that the JVM is going to do for us. Your virtual threads that you create will be running on a worker thread an important thing here called a carrier thread. So in other words, one live thread is the thing that is going to be processing your particular virtual thread. So schedulers are implemented with a fork join pool and we'll do a demo so that we could see how that works. Carrier threads are daemon threads. And so in other words, kind of like background threads. Uh, and you know, whenever you're uh, doing a sig term, you know, uh, daemon threads will go along with it. 
Uh, number of initial threads is going to be runtime, get runtime available processors. And new threads can be initialized with what's called a managed blocker. If a thread is blocked, uh, new threads are uh, created. I don't know where the word created went. Nothing like creating slides during a presentation. There we go. I don't know what happened there. All right, there we go. <laughs> then they're created. Parking is uh, when uh, we're running a virtual thread and we halt, okay, in a continuation. And we're yielding. And I showed you what the yielding will do. Go up to a point, do something else, and then come back to it. Uh, so whenever we reach that yield point, whenever we need to suspend for whatever reason, we will take that stack, we will take that code. Now remember, our thread now is perceivably very much like a, a single C source code, I guess, from beginning to end, and we're just conceiving it that way. Uh, we, we are not thinking about yielding. We are not thinking about jumping onto another thread. We're not thinking about using reactive programming. We're not thinking about any of that, which is awesome because all we're thinking about is from point A to point B with some pauses in between, but I don't care because the JVM will take care of that for us. And so once we reach a, um, a blocking point like thread sleep or we're doing some IO, we're waiting for a response from a web service, we're sending to a database, we're sending to Kafka, whatever it is, right? For something like that, um, you know, that's gonna be a block. And the JVM will take care of that for us, okay? And we'll take our stack and park it somewhere and then, you know, work on somebody else's work. And then when it says it's ready, uh, which is like, uh, let's see, is Michael here? Michael, are you there? I don't know if Michael's there. I was gonna ask him. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, good. Thanks for that uh, spelling correction there, Ken. Appreciate it. Got an eye. Not only are you a teacher, you're a programmer as well because you're able to uh, catch that. All right, but uh, I was going to uh, ask Michael if, uh, if he's ever eaten at uh, like Fogo de Chao. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if you've eaten there. Sorry, vegetarians, it's be kind of gross for you. <laughs> but um, uh, when you go eat at like a Brazilian restaurant, um, or when, <laughs> whenever we're able to do that next, <laughs> after the after uh, coronavirus is uh, mostly over. But anyways, you go to a Brazilian restaurant, you get filled up with all the different sorts of food. And usually at these Brazilian restaurants, they have like a little uh, I guess a semaphore, right? <laughs> Where you, it's green, uh, when it's green and uh, it's a cylinder and it's pointed up and it's green, it says, and it's, it's your way of saying, give me more food. I'm hungry. I'm still hungry. Please come on over. <laughs> Whatever you have, bring it over. And then you usually get full and then you're like, oh, I'm done. And you flip it over and it's red. Oh, I don't want any more food, right? Uh, and then what happens? Then they bring out the pineapple, right? That pineapple looks good. It has all the brown, you know, the browns at the end and it's a little bit burned on the outside, delicious and moist on the inside. Mm, I love that pineapple. So what do we do? We flip that uh, back to green. I was like, I thought I was full, but I saw that pineapple and, you know, let's just, we'll make some room for that. <laughs> and so you get that. Now, uh, what does that have to do with what we're doing here? If we're going to park, we're going to park our process. You know, our process would need to run. And as part of this, internally, this is already done. Uh, once it's done, it's going to kind of do the Fogo de Chao or Brazilian restaurant and say, okay, <laughs> flip the cylinder over, I'm ready. Uh, let's go ahead and continue. And then the scheduler will reschedule that particular process uh, back onto a thread, okay? And that's what parking would do. So on here, let's say we have some code and we're running a virtual thread which is running on a Java Lang thread. And we hit, let's say, thread sleep. So what we'll do then is we will park. So the blue over here is going to be stuck in the parking lot. And then the next part is, you know, someone else is running their particular process. And then when we are ready then uh, internally, uh, we will get our thread. Now, it just so happens that this one, let's say red here is gonna be our red thread. So when we get back, when we unpark that particular stack, 
back onto the virtual thread, which by the way, there's stack copying uh, that's going on. And um, one of the things that the engineers uh, over at, I was gonna say Sun, but Oracle had stated uh, is that stack copying is actually not that expensive. And so that's what we're doing here when we are parking this particular stack. And so given this now, we can unpark it, give it back to perhaps the same virtual thread. So here's red virtual thread or perhaps a different kind of thread altogether. And so we'll take a look at that. So the way it works now, uh, you know, pre-loom, you know, we have a blocking process um, that is, you know, running that particular thread, but it's up to the OS thread uh, to preempt, uh, you know, whatever it needs to do. Uh, but now with loom, we're gonna have our carrier thread and we'll have a blocking process and everything that needs to be done as far as like parking and handling and preemption is all gonna be done at the JVM level, uh, which should make things a little bit faster. And let me finish with this slide and let's handle some questions then. So uh, I don't know if you ever watched the movie Starsky and Hutch, <laughs> uh, but uh, if you have, you know about this guy, right? Do it, go on, come on, do it, do it, do it. All right, I'll get to it. <laughs> anyway, so do these things. Create your full task represented by your own thread. Just think about things kind of like as a single threaded um, you know, entity. Uh, add blocking code. Don't be afraid of that. Uh, right now, we are usually kind of hesitant for doing something like that. I know I am because I've been told don't block, don't block, don't block. And then as uh, my experience gained, it was like, well, I do like blocking, but in certain cases, I like blocking. Okay. Um, and uh, I talk about this a lot with uh, Kafka because in Kafka, we do things like consumer offsets. And um, we could do things like, um, you know, push an offset saying, I've read up to this point in my uh, pub sub, and I want to mark that as a consumer. And most of the time, I want to do that asynchronously. Uh, but sometimes I want to do things synchronously. So I'll choose, I will think about you know, how I'm going and why I'm doing synchronous and why I'm doing blocking. So I may do blocking intentionally, but now I may not even have to think about it that hard just because, you know, I'll block when I want to and the JVM will take care of it for me. Forget about thread pools, forget about reactive frameworks. I know they're awesome. <laughs> I think there'll be the ones that will be on the chopping block uh, coming after Loom, uh, maybe, and we'll see. So if you wanna do more then make more threads, it is okay to block again, just program without uh, consideration uh, to blocking or, you know, not think about blocking. Loom will handle most of that for you. All right, let's take a look over here. Uh, looks like we got a question here. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, so Claude Wilbur says, it's a great question. Uh, given a thousand virtual threads all doing socket read, how does the continuation mechanism avoid a thousand blocked OS threads? As stated with parking. So some like socket read uh, would be a block. It will halt there and we can continue later. We will just take that stack, uh, you know, put it on the park. And then whenever we're going to get that response from our socket read, that will flag uh, the scheduler, which is now in the JVM, uh, to bring that up onto an OS thread. Now, there's something called pinning, uh, and I don't think this is a part of pinning. Uh, so there's something as pinning where you can't park it. You can't uh, take that process out. Uh, they're trying to minimize what pinning is or what will pin for you, um, but uh, I don't think a socket read would be one of those. So it would halt We'll park it, put it somewhere else. Whenever the response comes back from our socket read, then we will continue. Uh, yes, yeah, because that's where we're holding off. So that's part of our continuation. Our continuation is going to be uh, kind of a tuple of what we have right now as far as state and what it is that we are going to be continuing on. Yep, all right, excellent questions. All right, so let's take a look at uh, how to create uh, some virtual threads. All right, so here it is. I downloaded Loom uh, from uh, GitHub, and uh, the instructions are on the website. All right, we just take a look at continuations. Uh, it's just as simple. So uh, here in a public static void main, I have a thread, start virtual thread. And uh, let me get rid of... 
the name here, so that way we can uh, take a look at this. So here it is. Um, at its very simple level, thread, start virtual thread. In here, this could either take a runnable task or we could provide it a name along with the runnable task. And here, all I'm doing is I'm just gonna print out what the uh, current thread is. So here, let's give this a run. Let's do an up here and uh, let's provide this one here. Now, I'm, I can't run this in an IDE right now. I hope to in the future, uh, but uh, for some like this, I just have to go about it uh, the long way. I guess what I could have done is I could have just done a Java C Java without a build tool, but whatever, it's not gonna take that long. Uh, but when we run this, uh, we will be able to see hello Loom and here it is. Number 17 is the ID fork join pool. Like I said, everything is backed uh, by a fork join pool uh, with some uh, carrier threads. Okay, that's pretty cool. Um, I could design things uh, either to run immediately. So for something like this, uh, by the way, in this case, I'm using a builder. So I could use the builder pattern here, uh, which is a little bit different than this one over here. This one is hey, I don't care what you're doing, let's start a virtual thread right now. <laughs> and uh, the E2 portion here, this one here is, the, hey, I wanna use the builder pattern, virtual task, and uh, go ahead and run what you need. And uh, let me just go ahead and make that uh, a Lambda. All right, let me clean up my code here. Driving me loco, there we go. <laughs> and then finally we'll have a start. All right, there we go. And uh, you know, from this, uh, this will be a uh, thread that uh, we can run. So you could use a builder for something like that. I won't, I won't run that one. I think you'll know what, what's happening there. Uh, let's see. So this one, um, I think I ran that one already. Let's do this one here. Um, as part of the builder, one of the things that you can do is you could do thread builder virtual, then the task of whatever it is that you wish to run. There it is, beautiful, and builder virtual uh, task. Except this time, uh, what I'm doing is I'm calling build. So if you want to, you could opt with build. And what that would do is do the thread. And now that you have this, you can call it at any time. Your choice, if you wanna run it a little bit further down in your code, then you could do so and run thread.start. Pretty awesome in the way that works. So very simple in the way that works. Uh, let's see, here's one uh, with a factory. And so one of the things that we can do, and you'll see a lot of samples like this now with uh, a lot of loom samples that you may see. This one's using a thread factory that we can wire in into our executor service. And I think most of us right now are very familiar with what an executor service is. And so here's this new thread executor, okay? This one's brand new uh, with Loom. New thread executor. And uh, for this one, we're going to plug in the thread factory. And here's how we create the thread factory. Thread builder virtual, then dot factory. Then we could plug that in. And once we have that, now we have an executor service that we can use. Uh, we will call submit, which I think many of you are already familiar with, provided whatever kind of callables or runnables that we would like. Uh, we could also submit a collection of tasks as well. Now this one is, I'm getting a future, but really I don't think I'm, yeah, I am using it right over here. This will do a block uh, with a get, which is kind of like a join in this particular context. So this one is E4 virtual thread with factory. And uh, let's try a couple of these lines here. This one is, let's just uh, take a look at what thread is running and is our thread virtual? So there's going to be something uh, in here. Let's, uh, that's not good, there we go. And we'll have a method in here called is virtual, okay? So it will tell us, hey, are we, are we looking at things virtually or, or not? If this is just a regular OS thread, then this will be false. If it is virtual, then that will be true. All right, let's give this one a try. This one is called E4, uh, virtual thread with a factory. Let's take a look. All right, go ahead and run that one. Let 
All right. And away we go. Is our, uh, is our, is our thread virtual? Yes. Uh, running in our thread, uh, again, number 17 will have the ID in here, and fork join pool number one. Okay. Excellent. Now, my favorite example is this one over here. All right. So after everything that we've learned up to this point, I'm going to do a couple of things. Uh, one is I'm going to print out my process ID or PID that is running on my operating system. All right. I don't know if you know this. Uh, there's something called a process handle, uh, which came out in JDK 9. I was going to guess 9, but that's where it came out. Uh, so I don't know if you know this. I know some of you are stuck at 8. I'm sorry. Hope to see you in the future soon. <laughs> Anyways, uh, for those that are running uh, 9 and higher, you could actually tap into your uh, process ID. So that's kind of cool. So you could do process handle current PID. Uh, and I'm going to sleep for 20 seconds because what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my Java monitoring and manage console, J console, uh, to take a look at how things are working. Okay, so first things first, uh, let me, I'm going to comment that out. So I'm not using virtual threads first. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take uh, eight fixed threads, which in turn are going to be OS threads. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use stream iterate to go from zero onward to an infinity. Uh, it's one of my favorite calls. And then for each one, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start a process and I'm going to block it. Okay. So I'm just going to do a system out format block for five seconds, okay, like thread sleep. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say I'm finished. And then I'm just going to return some sort of value, which I don't care about. And so what I'm going to do, well, here, let's do this. And I think for like uh, eight processes that I want to do, I think this would do fine, okay? And I'll do an executor service shutdown. Let's take a look at how this is going to look. Uh, let's see, I want to run uh, E5. Let's see here, control R, E5, there we go, let's run it. Okay, so this is no virtual threading. Let's see what happens here. All right, 35021. So let me make a new connection here, 35021. 021 connect and uh, let's take a look and uh, insecure connection that's fine and here we go all right let's take a look at threads and here we go so these are the live threads so uh it jumps up uh it just it doesn't jump up too bad i mean what it does is uh procures the eight threads and so my application is over but we'll see here um eight uh, threads here. Now, if I just did, if I redid this with like new thread, new thread, new thread, new thread, new thread, this thing would explode. This would be just like, whoop. hey, I'm just creating a bunch of threads and uh, it would just go nuts. Uh, this one is because I'm constraining it with a executor. So that way I have eight threads here. Uh, anyway, so that's why this jumps up eight. Uh, this one had like 15 or 16 to begin with uh, just because of you know, standard Java threads that need to run anyway. Uh, but this uh, spiked up and then uh, went down. Okay, fair enough. That looks pretty good. But let's see what happens then uh, once I beef this up to 600. Let's take a look here. All right. So let's change the limit here to 600. So we will create 600 uh, calls. And uh, let's go and give this a run again, and let's see what this will look like. All right, good. Virtual thread, uh, scanning for projects. Let's take a look. Okay, by the way, if my computer crashes, I'll come back. <laughs> All right, uh, PID 35105. Let's take a look over here, 35105. Connection, let's take a look here. Three, oh, there it is, up, up at the top. Okay, insecure connection. Now this one's probably not going to show 
that much craziness on here, but you're going to see a performance hit uh, most definitely. So we went from five to, ooh, interesting, 25. Let's take a look here. Let's go to threads here. So I have, um, no, it's not too bad. I have eight threads uh, going on here, uh, but take a look at this. Crunch, 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 crunch. <laughs> Because I'm trying to do this to, what was it, 600? And right now I'm at 55. So there it is. They all have the same thread level on each one. And they're trying to use each particular thread. Okay. So I'm going to hit Control C because I don't want to wait that long. And so what I'm going to do then is let's come in over here. And uh, let's see, someone has a chat. Can you run JConsole on Windows? I don't know, but it's a it's Java. I mean, all of it's Java, so you should be able to. I'm going to go with uh, likely. 85% likely. All right, so what I'm going to do then is I'm going to change out this executor service and comment this one out. Now we're going to go into virtual threads right now. Let's take a look at this one. All right, so we saw, all I'm doing here is just changing the uh, executor on this one. Let's see, any questions or statement? Oh, okay, yes, we do it on uh, uh, JConsole on Windows. Okay, thanks for the help there. See, I love a good community who does not All right, so uh, let's see, I'll cancel that. And uh, let me go ahead and run this one again. All right. Uh, let's see, so uh, we will, uh, run that one. Compiling. I don't know why I'm packaging. Anyway, 35206. Let's take a look here. Let me create a new connection. 35206. Oh, My gosh. I'm going slow. <laughs> here we go. Insecure connection. All right, here we go. Let's take a look at uh, what this one's going to do as far as this performance. Look at that. I'm already done with the 600. Is that amazing? And then here's a 600. So I went around the world twice on this one. And look at this graph here. Remember, it was just a poof, and continue, continue, continue. Uh, but with virtual threads, it's like, okay, I'm done. Uh, what else you got for me? Holy moly, that is fantastic. Uh, so here it is. And here's that graph. It just dropped. Uh, it just used, oh, and we have half the workers. Like I was nice, generous before. I was like, here, take eight workers. <laughs> but this one is like, man, eh, here, do four. Let's see what you could do with it. Okay. And it did it. And that's fantastic. And here it is. So here are the IDs associated with it. Okay. And um, here, let me go back to eight. So uh, you should be impressed already with that uh, just because it runs things uh, extremely well. Uh, but let me just, you know, come back to 10. So obviously, you know, it could handle it and it could handle it very well. Uh, let me come back over here and run it again uh, with 10. I just wanted to show uh, something here. In the meantime, any questions or statements? This should really excite you because again, you just think about just some code with a block in it and that's fantastic. Okay. So 35317, here, let's take a look over here. 35317. Uh, did I just get rid of J console? Okay, I guess it doesn't matter. All right, we'll just let this one run and let's take a look. All right, so this one is just gonna be 10. And here's our 10. So it did uh, three. So for this one is I'm doing something and then sleeping and then doing something else, right? After the sleep, I'm doing a block here. Uh, just so you know, let's, uh, let's take a look at zero when did when did zero start did zero ever start oh yeah here it is zero started zero started with 17 no that one's the same it's not always going to be the same let's try number six 24 in this case it just happens to be just a sheer dumb luck uh but it could you know in case of a block yeah i was hoping this would come up a little bit different but it's not but that's fine uh, process eight ran on, oh, I'm looking at the wrong thing, aren't I? I'm looking at the thread. Let's see. Seven was on worker two. And seven is on worker one. Hey, there we go. 
So uh, process seven, as you can see here, it was doing fine up to a point and then we blocked and then we went down here and it went, it went to uh, worker number one, okay? So after the block, you may just end up you know, somewhere else, okay? All right, so I think that was really exciting. Uh, let's see, Ken Fogel asks, are virtual threads distributed across all CPU cores? Yes, yeah, or does it manage uh, threads in a single core? There are some flags that you can do, which would be the parallelism. So you can change it for the JVM. So yeah, there's a flag. I forgot what the flag was, uh, but yeah, there's a flag. So if you want to uh, make parallelism one, then that would just be a managing on a single core. Uh, but I think by default, it's going to do all the cores. Are virtual threads supported? I don't think right now, thinking about Quarkus right now, but here's the great thing, uh, Srini, is that Java's goal in all this, and I can't believe I'm already running out of time, but uh, I have about, I think, five minutes left since we started a little bit late, five or 10 minutes. But um, the great thing about something like this is that Java is taking really good care of making sure that we're not only backwards compatibility, but that you don't do that much work when you need to upgrade to this. Because everything in the end is just doing a new thread. You could also use an executor service. All you need to do, and coming back over here, would just be swap out your executor service. It's still an executor service. You're just swapping out an implementation for it. So your need to like, you don't have to say, oh, I got to re-engineer this whole thing again. You don't have to do that. You just swap out the executor service or, you know, how you do a thread. So that's pretty awesome the way that works. Okay. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, I think there were some uh, downsides uh, for this one, particularly, uh, and so here, let me come in over, over here. I don't have any demos right now for error handling or stack traces, Steve, but one of the things that is really great about this is because the state of our thread is actually just one Java object. So after the threads are running or what have you, we could just you know, take a look at what it is. And I don't think they have anything quite yet. So that still needs to be solidified before Loom comes out. So any downside, the downside is yes, a fraction of it, and that is pinning. So uh, here, let me come in over here and let me talk about some things that I, I wasn't able to, uh, I don't have that much. So I think I'm, I'm doing good on time. So uh, someone asked the question, it's a, it provides a nice segue for me right now, is with pinning. So um, if you think that your process is always, always, always going to need a dedicated thread, then a virtual thread is not for you because you need that dedicated thread and you don't want it to park. Uh, you just want it continually running. So think about just using a standard thread for something like that. And that would be the only case for something like that. Now, a virtual thread is pinned to its carrier, which is the Java Lang thread, and is mounted, uh, but is in a state in which it, it cannot be unmounted. If that's the case, then that's called pinned. So if a virtual thread blocks while pinned, it will block its carrier, and that carrier is unable to you know, do work uh, for any others. So this behavior is still correct, but it holds on to a worker thread for the duration that the virtual thread is blocked, making it unavailable for other virtual threads. So occasional painting or painting, pinning <laughs> is not harmful. A uh, very frequent pinning would be something that you would have to avoid. So here's some pinning situations. A synchronized block, public void or public synchronized void, public synchronized int. Uh, when you do that uh, on the method, uh, or if you have your own synchronized block, synchronize this or some other object, uh, then that would cause a pinning situation. How do you avoid that? Use a stamped lock for it. Stamp lock performs better than a reentrant lock, and it's a preferred way for better performance. Another thing, I don't know if uh, any of you, uh, tell me yes on the chat. If you use JNI, Java Native Interface, you need to contact C, you need to contact I don't know, Haskell, <laughs> or, or any, you know, uh, native language. Um, if you have that, this will never go away, uh, no matter how. So um, you aren't, you know, going to 
uh, get away with that when you're always going to constantly be pinning if that particular stack is using a JNI and it's waiting a long time and it's taking up a lot of resources that will still uh, consistently pin. Okay, well, let's see how many yeses are still using JNI. Okay, Claude, yeah, JNI to C. I have used JNI, I have as well. <laughs> Kareem, I haven't, thank you. <laughs> Excellent. All right, wonderful. Okay, so uh, another thing that I want to cover probably in the next couple of minutes, I'll try to do a redacted version here. Uh, launching a task in a new thread is really no better than programming with go to uh, is a statement. And I think about this statement as, yeah, I guess so. Like if we have, if we have a callback, that's kind of like a go to, right? Hey, just go over there and, and process it. Uh, so launching a task in a new thread, again, no better than go to. So this is where structure con uh, concurrency corrals the thread lifetimes into code blocks. Well, um, you can take a look at the slides. I gave you uh, where the location is. Let me give you an example of a structured uh, concurrency in this case here. One of the things that allow us to have a structured concurrency is this. An executor service can be created within a try with resources block. And that's how they go about it. And now once I have this, I could do a submit. But what's really great about this is that this essentially becomes a join, an implicit join that I don't have to necessarily explicitly state. At the end of this block, it's going to wait for all the child processes to finish. And that's really awesome. Here, let's take a look at this one. And uh, let's try that E6. I may just have time for one demo uh, on here. And uh, that way we could probably do a little bit of uh, uh, Q&A on here. Uh, let's see, what's the name of this one? So E6, structure concurrency. So what we're looking at here is we have one task that's going to take three seconds, another task that's going to take seven seconds. And then I'm just going to do the, the total on the uh, number of seconds here. So let's take a look at this structured uh concurrency here as to what that will do. And again, in order to do this, put in a try with resources block. And at the end of the block, that will essentially be a join for any task that you have there. And then what you could do is you can create other executor services that are essentially going to be children of the parent executor service and will wait as ever it needs to, will handle terminations very well and interruptions. So here it is. This took just a tiny fraction over seven seconds. I think I pro <laughs> that should be milliseconds. I know the teacher's going to be like, wait a minute, <laughs> that's milliseconds. I'm <laughs> like, yes, that is. All right, so I will, I will do a pull request. All right, fixed it. <laughs> All right, so there it is. So this took, um, you know, 7,000 uh, milliseconds uh, because this one was, uh, had seven, but this one was going on for three. And as you can see here, I have an implicit uh, an implicit join. Uh, but here's just a really quick example I'll try to sneak in here. Um, and that is other subtasks. So in other words, here's the root on this. Let me uh, expand this out here. There we go. And so here's the root. Again, try with resources block. I will have an implicit join here. But what we can have as well, and I think this is going to be really exciting, is that let's say in a task one, I too want to also create an executor service here and run some processes in that as well. So this executor essentially becomes a child of the parent executor service. And this would be great for debugging threads, I think, just because everything has its place, everything has a parent, uh, you know where to look, you have structure for it. And this is what's meaning by thread structure, you know where everything is going to be located. It's gonna make tracing, it's gonna make debugging a lot easier to use. And um, yeah, I can't wait for this to come out. All right. So uh, just a last uh, couple of items here then. Uh, Re-implemented Java IO. So uh, they're going in and just changing the internals, moving the furniture in the house without changing where the windows and doors are. So you still have the same interfaces just behind the scenes. They'll be uh, fixing that. So. Again, they're gonna make some changes in here for the debugger a little bit. Uh, one of the things is because you can create millions of virtual threads, 
um, you know, debugging can get kind of hellish, like which of these million threads am I going to take a look at? So uh, they're thinking of ways and talking with uh, IDE programmers on how that's going to look. And uh, profiling uh, is going to be a little bit clearer now just because everything has a defined boundary. Okay. And you could use tools like uh, Java Flight Recorder uh, to uh, take a look at you know, what's going on behind the scenes. All right. So I think uh, that will do it here. Any other, uh, any questions? And Michael, are you still there? You, I am still here. Oh, right on. You, usually I only ever mute on my microphone, but mm -hmm. occasionally I will mute or I will be muted in Zoom. And in those situations, I am always caught off guard. Uh, but I, 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 I do like that my microphone lights up so I know when it's hot. Uh, but occasionally that can be misleading when I'm overwriting it at the at the. Uh, it, it looks like it's literally hot. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, speaking of hot, I, 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 I find all of these capabilities to be a, a, a extremely exciting. And I'm I, I actually I, I have. Uh, I have to benchmark something, and uh, and 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 the backend implementation isn't really relevant. It's it's more of a network thing, <clears throat> but I think that I can demonstrate that uh, optimizing code uh, will will uh, give us some some value over optimizing the network necessarily. But uh, really, really exciting stuff. And Dano, as always, you are you you bring a great deal of expertise, uh, and and your own personality into what we're into what we're diving into. And I think that's what. Yeah, you weren't there for my Fogo de Chao. I was going to ask you about that. <laughs> I no, I did have to step away for a minute. Um, although I do love me some Fogo de Chao, and mm -hmm. uh, I for one look forward to being able to go and and dine into restaurants again. That's uh, right. I, I, I I normally I I am a I am a carnivore at heart. But uh, mm -hmm. I think the last time I was at a Fogo de Chao, what I loved the most was the roasted pineapple. Yeah, he talked about that. <laughs> Everyone loves the roasted pineapple. Yeah, that was the thing I was talking about because I was talking about the, the little cylinder and then you put, okay, I'm full. But then the pineapple comes out and you're like, ah, never right, mind. Right. <laughs> That's right, never mind. Green, green, green. <laughs> but, and you wave uh, that cylinder at the waiter, yeah. <laughs> right. Cool. Excellent. Any questions, anybody? I hope you're just, excited. When are we it. when are we going to meet up at Fogo de Chao? That's right. We got to choose a city though. Uh, I, I I vote Denver. I'm biased Works for me. Yep. And uh, you know All what right. we should do is uh, Uber UberConf. By the way, uh, the No Fluff Just a flagship event is right now. Physical. Uh, I mean, yeah. I, I mean, um, that, that hybrid, we, we, right? Yeah, we're 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 proceeding, assuming that uh, that things continue to trend the direction they're trending. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and honestly, I've been to so many conferences over the last ten years, uh, international ones, big ones, small ones, community ones, and nothing compares to the experience that is UberConf Live. Not even so, close. Yeah. See, yeah. Dave, you know. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Ibrahim. Especially yeah. when they get big I, like that. I mean, big conferences yeah. normally just go downhill, but that one doesn't. It's just the. Yeah. Um, uh, I think the uh, arrangement of the room is going to be interesting. Like, I, I picture the attendees probably still wearing masks. I think, but the speaker will have to be like eight feet away. I don't know how that works, and I think most of us are will be injected by, <laughs> or vaccinated, not injected, uh, vaccinated <laughs> by July. Yeah. And that's, that's, I think the that's the hope. The way it'll go. Uh, I, I, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm looking forward to seeing so many of you fine folks in person again. That, uh, yeah, you know what I, great. what I realize is, is I don't that's necessarily right. miss presenting. I don't miss the travel, but, I, but I do miss the people. Yeah, Steve just said uh, we'll be behind plexiglass, which I can't yeah. wait. Because every time I'll I try there. to do that mime thing, I always do it <laughs> like wrong. Like one hand is always like closer <laughs> to the other. Although that was like pretty effective. Room. Because you were doing this in my screen. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, thank you so much, folks. And yeah, uh, thanks, Dano. Thanks. Yeah, buddy. James has a question here. Uh, will uh, non-blocking I/O become irrelevant? I I'm going to bet yes. Uh, that's my bet, mm. and I'm betting uh, reactive frameworks 
are going to be useless. I'm sorry. I know you're, a lot of you are putting a lot of effort into uh, Project Reactor and Arcs Java. I don't know. That's, a, that's what I think. I don't think uh, futures or completable futures are going away because I think you'll still need to do flat maps and maps on the results of your futures. And then you could just tie that in uh, to a thread pool. But um, yeah, we'll see what's in the chopping block when this comes out. But yeah, go uh, ahead, Michael, please. Oh, no, no. I was just going to say really, really awesome stuff. And, and do check out nofluffjuststuff.com. Learn more about UberConf. Learn more about our, uh, our, our workshops. In fact, Dano, I'm pretty sure you're you're queued up to cover a few topics, including Java 2021. Uh, that's just in a couple of weeks. What's new in Java? Yeah, I like that one because I see all the tears from people who use Java 8. <laughs> and uh, they're just like, I wish I could use Java 15. I'm like, I wish you could use it too. But yeah. yeah. This golden ticket thing, this is like five years of world-class content. The combo pass is amazing. But yeah, these virtual workshops that we're running uh, pretty much daily, Right now, we, we, we actually, we got two going on today. Uh, yeah. Deep dive into Spring and Spring Boot and Modern JavaScript. And then uh, starting next week, Cloud and Data app Architecture for Enterprise Apps, Helm and Customize, Alexa Skills, CI, CD. You know what? Alexa Spring. Skills are going to be where it's at. Like, I, you know, I, I think Craig was right all along. Like, I think we're all going to be programming, like, you know, what is the status of this shipment? Uh, rather than you go onto a computer, like have that tied into your business is just going to be, you know, fun. And and nobody's going to do better than everything teaching that, that than Craig. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and I know, uh, oh, Ibrahim the, the, asked about the podcast. I've been, I've been, I've been called out. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, get with it. I, I, well, I, 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 I would like to resurrect that. Uh, I, I, I miss it. Uh, you know, a lot of things changed in 2020 and, and it was, it was already kind of, a uh, languishing under multiple competing priorities, but, but you know, a lot has been restructured and I, and, and, and I could definitely see that making a comeback. Any, any quest, any, any suggestions on topics to dive into for the podcast? Yep. Uh, Kareem, good to see you again. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, actually, that's a good point. Yep. We're, we're way over, so we should probably wrap up. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, it's but, just that yeah. we miss each other. And that's the thing I noticed this gets longer and longer after we do yeah. a, a particular but, session. That'd be a good topic for the podcast is how, how, how are we going to get back, get people back together again? Yeah. That's right. And actually Dave, uh, why don't we talk about Confluent, Confluent Cloud, Kafka? Sure. Uh, that'd be that'd be kind of a win-win, I imagine. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of I, I kind of do that for uh, no fluff, but uh, yeah, no one knows more than Dave. I'm just kind of like well, I, I only, more than me. I only <laughs> get what Dave tells me too, anyway. <laughs> right. So it's, it's great that you get it from the source. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's great. So everybody, like if if. Uh, yeah, if if that's a possibility, yeah, there's so many great things with uh, Confluent Stack is just a you know great data flow a, a tool for just about everything. Yep. Yeah. Well, right on. Uh, let's let's Good wrap it up. Big thank you to all the folks. Thanks everybody. Good job, Dano. Thank you. Bye.